What does it mean to be ethical while serving in public office? That's a big question right now in the U.S. and also here in New Mexico. There have been several bills introduced in the legislature in recent years that would have increased oversight of campaign finance spending, but most haven't gotten very far in the legislative process. There have also been calls from some lawmakers and outside groups to create an independent ethics oversight commission for government officials here in New Mexico. And this week, we are kicking off our 2017 coverage for the People, Power and Democracy Project, a collaborative reporting project with KUNM, New Mexico In-Depth and the New Mexico Newsport. We invited leaders from New Mexico Ethics Watch to join us to talk about why ethics matter. I'm here today with Vic Bruno, who is the treasurer of New Mexico Ethics Watch, and Douglas Carver, who is the executive director. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. So, Doug, lots of people are concerned about the influence of money in politics, but we often talk about, you know, campaign contributions mm -hmm. and outside groups that are spending money on television ads. You guys are focusing on, focusing on something that's really specific and a little esoteric. That's correct, uh, with, um, and campaign finance disclosure is important and who's funding our campaigns is important, but no one in the state is really looking at the personal financial disclosure statements that most state elected officials and cabinet secretaries and other state officials need to file. And so New Mexico Ethics Watch decided to take a look at those and um, we're somewhat surprised at what we found. Well, what did you find? We found that no one seems to be looking at these forms after they're filed. We examined over 560 of them, and we were rather stunned to find that many of them are filled out incorrectly, um, not signed, have no information on them. And then looking deeper into the Financial Disclosure Act, which is the act which requires people to file these forms, the act is so full of loopholes and uh, requires generality in reporting that even if a form is filled out perfectly correctly, the public knows nothing about the finances of the official who submitted the form. Vic, you work in real estate, am I right? I do. So, you know, what, how important is it that these folks tell us uh, what their personal business dealings are? Is, is, is this kind of ethical disclosure something you deal with in your work? Absolutely. Um, you know, the National Association of Realtors, which you, uh, amidst the realtor brand that you hear about, has its own code of ethics. And that document was begun in uh, 1913, and it's been improved and updated, and it has an enforcement process where the public is invited to uh, bring a complaint against a realtor if, uh, if they feel they've been disadvantaged some way, and there's a formal process for dealing with that. One of the things that we find in real estate, which is sort of akin to what you find in the political spectrum and, and other, elsewhere in business and, and real life, is that uh, people sometimes find themselves in conflicted situations. Sometimes it's innocent, sometimes it's sort of willful. Mm -hmm. And being able to separate those two is important. Um, and having a process to vet that is also important. In the political spe spectrum, you know, we, we look to our elected officials to preserve the public trust. We're the public, we're the unelected folks. And when they commit a bad act, you know, we have to have a way to know about it. The financial disclosures are a way for them to hold themselves accountable by properly filling them out and following uh, those uh, expectations about conflicts with what they are involved with uh, to the letter. And when they don't, there should be a process for um, how do we deal with that? How do we get them to stop that behavior and that sort of thing? And so usually in the real estate world, it's a small minority of people, one, two, three percent of uh, realtors might find themselves in that uh, position. And, and I expect it's the same in the political spectrum. Most people go with the good intention of preserving the public trust, and sometimes they just kind of go astray. But so what are the kinds of things that if this system were working, we would be turning up in these forms? Well, the um, initial impetus for looking at these was a curiosity about how legislators vote and whether that those votes might affect something in their personal financial portfolio. Uh, there's no way to tell from what we see. So the kind of thing that might turn up is um, you voted for a bit of legislation that um, helps investments that you have or your family has, 
or perhaps you had a capital outlay project funded that ends up increasing the value of your property. Um, I keep using the example when I talk to people about the report of Denny Hester, the former Speaker of the House of Representatives back east. And granted, he got in trouble for a lot of other more serious things. But because they have better financial disclosure there, it was found that he helped to get funded, funded a road expansion near a piece of property he has, and the property value of that skyrocketed. We wouldn't be able to tell that um, with our financial disclosures. Because not only are the requirements general, there's a whole separate question of what's going on with capital outlay and how obscure that process is. You know, you mentioned nobody looks at these forms. I know nobody looks at these forms because I have looked at them and asked other people about them and no one has a clue. So, Vic, is it a problem that there is no auditing of these things and that they know no one's looking at them? Is that part of the reason they're just haphazardly filled out? When, when people are able to operate es essentially in the dark, you know, think all bad things kind of happen in the dark, not in the, not in the light of day. And so if no one's looking at them and they're tucked away, sure, that's when things kind of can happen. And I'd like to um, just elaborate that on a little bit. I know our Secretary of State's office is incredibly overburdened and incredibly underfunded. Yes. And I do want to emphasize the fact that our report was uh, completed and the research, initial research was completed before the present Secretary of State took office. That's right. Uh, so what we found, the oversights we found from 2014 to 2016 were before um, Secretary Toulouse Oliver took over. Uh, but it is evident no one's looking at these. And it's not just legislators. We mentioned legislators, but cabinet secretaries, governor, lieutenant right. governor. And one big problem is that no one really knows exactly who is supposed to be filing these. The statute says um, appointed officials, statewide electeds, legislators, chairs and people on boards and commissions. And then we have another very vague requirement that says if you have a financial conflict, then you should submit a statement to the secretary. Since the Secretary of State's office stopped a number of years ago posting them online, no one can look and see what's there. And there's no list or anything um, to let the public know who should be filing and whether or not um, they've missed a filing. So there's no accountability at all. And that's, I mean, that's even before we get to the problems with the law. As I said before, if everything was done correctly, Secretary looked at all of them, the law is so vague, so general, by design, that we still wouldn't know anything about the finances and possible conflicts of interest with our state officials. I think, I think there's another point that maybe is worth discussing, and that's the issue of privacy. And so the, you have to, you know, the, the process has to balance the, the individual's privacy that has to file these disclosure. How deep do you go against the right of the public to know? And, and that can be a difficult thing. And that's where some of this ethics discussion certainly comes mm -hmm. into play. It's uncomfortable, certainly, to have to put out your home address and details about your personal finances and your investments and your work out there. Mm -hmm. But it, but it is important for the public to see that stuff. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, and and I think that uh, the 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 recommendation of New Mexico Ethics Watch is to actually have the Secretary of State post that on the website, rather than have, having to file information requests. Have, uh, have you talked to her about it? I haven't talked to her about it. I've. Um spoken with people in her office about the report and gave a general sense of our recommendations and we provided the secretary's office with a copy of the report. Um, I anticipate um, that some action will be taken. It, the office has been, as everyone knows, has been in disarray for a couple of years now. Um, so we're all hoping for good things out of the secretary's office. Um, we need to right that ship. So, you know, one of the things we often hear about when these ethics uh, issues come up is that, you know, this is just, this is a political tool, this is, you know, uh, folks trying to target elected officials or public officials for political reasons, so who are you people? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Who are you? <laughs> so, so listen, this is a bi bipartisan, or you might say nonpartisan group, and it's very important to know that. It, we don't give up our own individual ideology from whatever political spectrum we come from. And it's interesting, it's certainly exciting to me to be able to uh, come together, Republicans and Democrats, over a common cause. We recognize the value of good governance and what you have to do to get there. So we don't give up our ideology about how, 
education should be done or how this should be done or whatever. Those battles will continue um, and hopefully we find good benefit to the to the public that uh, needs to be served. But the idea of ethics is not party specific. Mm -hmm. It affects everyone. Mm -hmm. Doug, New Mexico Ethics Watch supports the idea of creating an independent ethics commission, which is a concept we've seen in the legislature over and over and over. What would that change in your mind? That's an excellent question. Um, and in full disclosure, I should um, let you and your viewers know that I had worked on some of the legislative proposals that look like they're going to reappear in this session when I was at the council service. It's hard to know what the commission would change because it would depend on how the commission was created. There's a great risk that you create something called an ethics commission that's just a shell commission. And that might possibly do more harm than good. But an ethics commission that's grounded in the Constitution has true independence from any one branch of government, has independent authority for investigations and subpoena power and operates transparently is something I th think would help focus the public's attention and public's mind on ethics in the state and help provide greater accountability for our public officials. Vic, we're, you know, th this proposal is coming up at a time when the legislature is trying to find money to finish this fiscal year sure. and the next one. Do we need money to do this? Uh, well, New Mexico Ethics Watch is its own organization. We're not, we're not the government. We are, but asking the government to spend more time looking at these forms, posting them, creating an ethics commission, costs well, money? Well, sure. I mean, you have to allocate staff resources, for example, in the Secretary of State's office. But some of the, some of the things that can be done are actually pretty simple. Date stamping the forms properly, making sure they're properly filled out. So somebody on the receiving end that's already doing that might just need a little help understanding the benefit of doing it differently. And if I could address a point on the budget issue. Um, I looked at the costing of the ethics proposals last year, and Representative Dine's constitutional amendment came in around $390,000. Um, they only had two FDEs, I think. Uh, full-time equivalent employees. Full-time equivalent employees. And I think, realistically, they would have to have a paralegal and an administrative assistant. So let's say 500000 just to ballpark it. And Representative Egolf, then Representative Egolf's bill um, came in at around $1.1 million. Now the state budget is, what, 16, 17 billion. And we realize that times are tight. Everyone knows that there's belt tightening going around. But I don't think the legislature can dodge and say we don't have the money. They need to be honest and say, we don't consider this a priority and therefore we don't want to fund it. You have to make tough choices in tight fiscal times. And if they want to make the choice that funding an ethics commission isn't important, then they should be honest about that choice. And, but I think in the long run, supporting an ethics commission is cost effective because if you have more ethical government, you're not getting petty corruption or as we saw with say, Manny Aragon um, and that whole scandal with the courthouse, massive corruption. When money is tight, you need everyone to be operating transparently and at the highest standards. And you can't let money being money be skimmed off of budgets, money being directed to projects where they don't actually help the state and help individuals. So if we fund an ethics commission, I think in the long run it would pay for itself, aside from being the right thing to do. Doug Carver and Vic Bruno, thank you so much for coming in to talk to us about New Mexico Ethics Watch. Thank you. Thank you.